This episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast is the audio portion of a recent live webinar that was done into the Sudden Cardiac Arrest UK Facebook group. As such, it references some visual elements that you could see within the webinar and also the audio quality is not quite up to the usual standard. But nevertheless, I think it's uh, worth releasing in its own right, so hopefully you'll find something useful and enjoy this episode. Hello, hopefully people can see and hear us there. Um, I'm Paul Swindell, if you don't know me already, and I'm with Dr. Marco Meehan, who is a clinical psychologist at the Essex Cardiothoracic Centre, uh, amongst other places. You're, you also work at... Yes, I work in different places, but I've, um, well, I've been working with the team um, of cardiologists, and not just cardiologists, at the Cardiothoracic Centre for about two years. Um, it's charity funded, so it started off as half a day, now it's got to one day a week, which is great. Um, the rest of the time, I currently have a three-day job in Westminster in a community neuro team, and um, one day of my week I spend it in an inpatient um, stroke rehabilitation unit um, in Redbridge. So I'm kind of scattered all around. Um, but um, I got to know the cardiologist in Basildon because I used to work in a stroke unit there. And when I left there, I continued my collaboration with the cardiologist because it's um, such an interesting uh, thing that they have set up. Um, I don't know whether you want me to talk about this in particular. Yeah, well, I was going to say, what, what, what sort of patients do you deal with typically? Not just at the CTC. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let, let's, because you know, many people that are watching us now might be wondering what, what does a clinical psychologist do, actually? Um, mm. So we, we are a protected title. So the HCPC, which is basically the organism, the organization, they make sure that um, only people who are qualified to... Um, do a profession, do actually the profession. We are um, practitioner psychologists, so we have to fulfill certain criteria uh, to become psychologist. Um, I actually studied in Italy, so my um, route has been slightly different, but obviously um, I got the equivalence. If uh, people study in the UK, you might expect somebody who has um, mo- most definitely um, got a degree in psychology, most likely has a master's degree as well has had most likely many years of experience as an assistant or a kind of research assistant and then has completed a doctorate in clinical psychology which is actually what allows people to become clinical psychologists. So all in all it's a lot of years of university, um, at least six but believe me most people do ten or even more. Um, And then to become a clinical neuropsychologist which I am not because I've not um, completed the qualification, but I'll tell you about it in a second. Yeah, please do. Is, um, is something called a qualification in clinical neuropsychology. It's called QICN. Uh, it's, um, I mean, there's no specific register of neuropsychologists as of today. Um, there is no immediate plan to bring one in. And you might find some psychologists that have a lot of expertise in neuropsychology that don't have these further qualifications for various reasons. My reason is just that it's um, very um, expensive and um, employers don't necessarily pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a lot, it's very time consuming. Um, you know, ultimately, I think every psychologist who work in neuropsychology will want to do it. It's, um, it's not compulsory at the moment, but um, this just just to give you an idea of the difference between clinical psychology and neuropsychology at the time. So a, a, neuropsych- a clinical neuropsychologist who calls themselves neuropsychologist is somebody who also has completed these further qualifications. However, you might see a clinical psychologist who has a lot of expertise and most likely the research background and the clinical background needed to become one but just hasn't completed it for a number of reasons. Okay, just just to set the scene. um, And so what do psychologists in general sort of look at? Um, Well, we try and, well, to put it as simply as possible, we try and help people to get better using um, kind of 
evidence-based therapies. And I think you might say that um, perhaps, uh, I'm not quite sure, but um, uh, we, we require a collaborat collaborative effort uh, from our patients. So we don't actually do things to the patient, we do things with our patients. Um, so we believe we've got some knowledge about what works in different kind of problems and conditions. And we just try and work together with patients and support them in overcoming the problems that are affecting their life at any point in time. So that's a very simple way to put it. I mean, we, we work with mental health conditions, but in I should stress uh, also very often in the context of physical um, disability. I mean, obviously there is no divide whereby we should only see people that have mental health, have mental health problems and physical therapy see people with physical, I mean, very often. So often the two things go hand in hand and actually one can exacerbate the other or or can actually make the other more bearable. So that's, that, that's, um, that's what we do. Um, and we work with long-term conditions. Um, <clears throat> so as, as a neuropsychologist, oh, say, let's put it, clinical psychologist with expertise in neuropsychology, so I should, I should say I, I have been working with people with neurological conditions for very long time, um, probably 15 years. Started off with a, with a team um, at Basildon because is it okay if I now talk about this? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm very yeah, happy I'm to take any questions if there are questions yeah. about no, uh, I think it's any to... particular questions about clinical psychology that people want uh, an answer for. So it's just about we are not scary people. We're just not normal. Because sometimes there is this idea that psychologists, oh, I don't want to see a psychologist. Uh, some, maybe you don't, maybe people don't need to see a psychologist. It's just about um, if there is a a level of distress then we can address, then we're very happy to see people and sometimes very often we can help. So that's what psychology is all about. It's not about being crazy, of course. I don't think I should say that, but um, sometimes I feel like it's best to say that because um, I'd like to think the stigma is all gone, but maybe it's not. And maybe I live in a psychology bubble and I think that there is no stigma, but uh, who knows what happens out there. Um, it's, it's so common for people to go through different um, periods of their life when things are difficult and that's just normal. Sometimes they get a little bit more difficult and then it's some psychological therapy which can be provided by different professionals and um, psychologists too when things get quite complex. Mm. Um, and I imagine with... Um, so it is sort of things that are perhaps going on in your head basically rather than dealing with the physical damage maybe from a cardiac arrest and with a, someone who's had a cardiac arrest there can be a lot of things going on in your head whether they're caused physically or from the, the memory of the trauma or guilt yeah. all sorts of things I imagine. Yeah I mean you know I work with dif all different types of neurological diagnosis um, cardiac arrest is not actually a neurological diagnosis I mean I should clarify this and most people Many people, I don't know if most, but definitely many people, a large percentage, don't actually have any sign of uh, brain damage. Um, I mean, when I was contacted by the cardiologist, I thought, I thought really long and hard about whether I should join them. I think that they were really driven by the fact that what they had noticed was that um, some people were coming back to the clinic and they were not happy about their life, uh, in, sometimes in quite dramatic ways. Um, and there seemed to be all sorts of problems, both for the survivor, whether they were not happy about um, the kind of support they had been given, certainly after discharge, sometimes in hospital. In hospital, people used to be, seem to be quite happy with the type of care they received, but then out of hospital, it's, it's, it's different. Um, sometimes they were complaining also of some cognitive problems, more often than not it's memory, but it's not just only memory. And then there were the family side of things. And as somebody who sees people with different diagnoses, I think family members of people that have had a cardiac arrest are really at very high risk of experiencing a lot of, um, potentially, um, a lot of trauma. It doesn't happen certainly to anyone. and. I, can certainly think of very many people that have coped really well, but it is, as always in psychology and in life, it's a very significant event, and depending on other things going on in your life, 
it might actually tip the balance in one way rather than another. It's a very significant thing. And for some people, it's, it, it's a lot to take on. Um, in an hospital, you don't necessarily see these things. You see the initial strong emotional reaction, which you would expect. And then people go in different directions. Some people may just progress um, into kind of um, adjusting to what has happened. Um, and adjustment can take different shapes and forms depending on, on what's, what, the out, what the outcome actually was of the cardiac arrest for the survivor and how the person who might have been there and witnessed it all has coped with the, with the aftermath. And it's, uh, it's, it's quite a complex thing. It's a very holistic thing. As psychologists, we are very interested in formulating problems. So we, we don't look just at the patient thinking, oh, this patient's had a cardiac arrest, that's the problem. I mean, we, that's definitely what has triggered, in this particular case, the referral. But um, you know, there are other things going on in life. There may be family, there may be children, there may be um, parents, there may be other illnesses that people have gone through before. All of these will contribute to the situation and how we cope. We may have a lot of strength or we may have, as is normally the case, a mixture of strengths and weaknesses. And, and we try to work out if there is an issue, what is making the issue so significant and how we can address it. Mm -hmm. So there's the emotional kind of thing, side of things, both for the survivor and the family member. And then there may be the brain injury side of thing, which we know for sure it's very often kind of overlooked. It is. It is. I mean, um, we t you touched on about the uh, what you're doing at Basildon there, and that's part of what they call the care clinic, isn't it? Yeah. Which is. Do you want to tell us about? Yeah. That? Um, obviously, things work in a different way in different parts of the country. Um, what we have set up uh, in Basildon, and this started before I joined the clinic, so the clinic has gone through different. Uh, iterations, um, but basically the way it works at the moment, um, we basically try to, well, let's, let's start from this. Um, so there is myself one day a week, there is a senior nurse, uh, again, one day a week that does the follow-ups. And what we aim to do is before people leave hospital, I actually aim to do a brief cognitive assessment of everyone. And now we also have an occupational therapist, uh, which is often involved with um, people who survived an out of hospital cardiac arrest. And so she has actually done most of this. And we try to use one that is tailored to the level of recovery. Obviously we can have all different levels of recovery from people that are seriously affected to the point that you know, they may be in a vegetative state and people that show absolutely no problem whatsoever and are quite happy to be discharged and to restart with their life where, where they left off where they left off um, so we but we try to do a cognitive assessment and I try to do an assessment of what, what would a cognitive assessment look like because yeah, I, mean, I know I, I didn't get one and I, I expect many, many people in the in okay. the group didn't so it's basically it's a brief assessment of memory, attention, concentration, the ability to be mentally flexible. It's really brief. The standard typical assessment is just five minutes long, maybe 10, depending on how quick or slow you are. And it gives a score. The score doesn't really matter, though there are um, you know, normative values. What it um, does is tell us um, whether there is any evidence that memory might be a little bit down and then obviously we check with you whether um, that's actually the case because for some people it may be that memory is not always been great obviously we have people that are successfully resuscitated in their 80s and some people have better memory than mine at 80 mm -hmm. but for some people that's not the case um, so it might be that it's actually in keeping with what it was before um, obviously we look at the cognition and then we think how is this going to impact on life after discharge and we discuss this with the patient so if somebody has kind of significant problems with speed of thinking that slow down or memory that is a bit patchy or even vision that is not quite the same as before I mean a number of areas can be affected then you know, we sit together with the patient and the family if possible and discuss how this is going to impact and, and plan discharge accordingly I guess most hospitals do this when there is 
clear evidence of a brain injury. Um, we try and do it with everyone, which obviously means that for many people there is a very good um, outcome. Now, for people that are perhaps, um, I wouldn't necessarily say just people that are younger, uh, but people that are younger definitely ask me more about the cognition. They want to make sure everything is spot on. So we may do a little bit more of an in-depth assessment, but in-depth still means 25, 30 minutes at that stage. I wouldn't do anything longer than that because things change quite quickly in the first few weeks, which is to be remembered. Um, and again, we use this to think about um, is return to work appropriate uh, and say in the next few weeks or is it better to uh, look at what we can do to kind of work on memory etc and obviously in an ideal world this needs to be coordinated with the input received from the cardiologist as well in terms of fatigue and management and physical activity and how much can be done and at what stage we are getting there, even for us it's a bit difficult to coordinate the care system with the cardiological input, um, also because people come and go quite quickly in hospital. Understandably, you don't want to stay in hospital for longer than necessary, but that makes it tricky if people are there one day a week to coordinate the effort. We do it um, and we you know, contact people after they've been discharged. So it's quite typical for me to give phone calls one week down the line or a few days down the line just to make sure that things were as we expected them to be. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in a way we are doing something similar to what many people with you know, a sort of mild concussion or traumatic brain injury may be getting at this stage. Yeah? So some cognitive assessment and assessment of psychosocial recovery in the early stages and then a follow up and a sort of hotline that people can contact if there are really any mm -hmm. huge issues. Yeah. And so, and so how long does this normally go on for? Uh, do, you, do you follow them up for a, a period of time typically? It, it's very individualized. Um, I always give, I mean, we have a leaflet, I give it to, to patients and there is my email address and I invite people to contact me if they have any issue. Luckily so far there hasn't been a huge demand because I don't think I could meet a huge demand. Normally we invite people around three, six months, but I have to be honest, I haven't been able to invite everyone. Sometimes I send batches of letters and then always hope that people don't actually all contact me saying I want an appointment because otherwise it would be, it, it hasn't happened, which mm -hmm. means that for most people things go quite well. Obviously there are the exceptions and sometimes I'm a bit worried that we are missing those people because they're difficult to reach or, or for many reasons. Um, but we do our best to contact around between three and six months and the and the senior nurse actually invites everyone back after six months um, as part of a follow-up of people that have been in ICU and if there is an issue that he thinks I might be able to address then we discuss and we make a referral. Is it, would that be Neil? Is that, yes, that's yes that's Neil, yeah. Um, and obviously because I'm just one day a week I generally don't take people for treatment although I have seen a few people but it's it's very tricky I only tend to do it as I will do it as a clinical neuropsychologist um, so I only take people that have a mixture of cognitive problems that have exacerbated the emotional problems and maybe there are some behavioral changes as well so when there is the, that mixture of brain injury related changes and emotional changes that can be quite difficult mm -hmm. to manage. So I only try to see. But if not, we can always make referrals to services available. They're generic services, not cardiac care specific services, but they can be appropriate for most people. So if someone was coming to see you for one of these sessions that you do on a Monday, what, what sort of things happens in, in that? Depends if it's... Um, so if it's someone that I'm seeing on the world, in which case um, it would be a kind of 40, 45 minutes long, potentially assessment of cognition and a psychosocial recovery. I try and see family members as well in hospital. It's really difficult because 
obviously family can only visit in the afternoon in most hospitals and it's just the timing is just difficult but I try I try to normalize first of all what's happening because in the first few days and weeks confusion is quite common um, it's not universal by any means but it's it's quite common to to struggle to do more than one thing at a time or to feel a little bit clouded and confused um, and if you don't know what's going on it can be scary and, and to be fair most people working on a cardiology ward will not tell you that this is likely to happen so it might it might feel like okay I'll just suck it and see but it's a little bit yeah, it's better if it's normalized if you know that it happens to very many people and it gets better so that that's just one part um, and the same for families because it can be we want to make sure that if there is anything really significant going on there and then we spot it and address it and if not we try and normalize what is happening and we give an appointment to review it at the appropriate time point which may be a few weeks later um, we give a leaflet a couple of leaflets actually we, we, we try to keep it brief um, what, what do those leaflets say? yeah it's just about what you what you might expect because um, we know we know that people go home with lots of leaflets and booklets and probably don't remember anything about it understandably i don't think i would if i was given an encyclopedia um, so we try and keep it um, short about what you might expect in terms of you know, both memory and emotional adjustment um, so that you know what's likely to happen and we give an email address a the possibility to contact a kind of crisis line um, luckily it almost never happens um, and that that's what happens if i see you in hospital you might i mean i might see people more than once if they have had some degree of brain injury and we start rehabilitation in hospital before making a referral to the most appropriate place and sometimes people experience probably delirium which is a kind of, kind of confusion that you have when you've been in itu for a while been loaded with sedatives for good reasons and then you kind of need to clear them from your body and, and your mind is not thinking straight so um, we kind of follow this up and make sure that people are orientated um, as much as possible and so maximized optimized from a medical perspective on the ward and also from the orientation etc if, if I'm seeing you for a follow-up it, it might be anything from one hour to two plus hours um, depending on what the need is if it's about cognitive assessment because people want to make sure that they are uh, actually capable of undertaking a kind of very highly demanding cognitive um, job um, or it could be it could be really any any three things um, either cognitive area assessment or something like a psychosocial adjustment for the family member or for the patient and yeah so that's what it is it, it tends to be just one or two follow-ups just because of capacity but um, if needs are identified I, I i will make a referral or no. i will suggest people self-refer i think it's quite important that you're just there and you're actually making contact with people because see so many people within the group say they had great care in the hospital like i did and then they get discharged and then that's it it is is uh ta-da thanks very much we you know we've we've uh, got you back alive as it were yeah and go off and try and live your life as best you could uh, or you can and uh it, it's an incredibly traumatic situation for people to go through um, the, and it has a, a, a large impact on their body and their brain and also the partner and so once all of that safety net of the hospital has been taken away mm -hmm. people f can feel very exposed and abandoned uh, and I, I use that in my talk but and I've seen other people talk about that so it, it, I think it's very important that you guys are just just there if people feel they need to speak to you and just uh, come and speak to you so it, can i just say we are only the first step of this process so what we aim to do in our with our limited time is actually identify problems so that's considering we only have kind of one day a week both myself and my colleague what we aim for is to identify problems when there are problems and be a kind of point of contact for patients and families that are struggling and and then we 
we refer, we sign post to the most appropriate service. Uh, that can be tricky because there might be a shortage of appropriate services. But um, that's what it is. Um, and then in terms of psychology and specific um, input, a lot can be provided. And I will stress the fact that uh, you know, the basic principles of, principles of psychology and you know, the main psychological therapies that you will have heard of, such as cognitive behavioral therapy there, they, they do really work um, and they can be very effective in treating very common problems after out of hospital cardiac arrest, such as anxiety and depression. Anxiety is very common. Depression can arise, of course, but anxiety is, is very, it's a very common problem. Um, and some people, of course, experience post-traumatic stress disorder. We start off, I mean, it may be post-traumatic symptoms, and for some people, they carry on for long enough to actually, and they affect life to the extent that, you know, if you want to look at diagnosis, people would actually um, get into this, um, this area. So they would, they would, actually have full-blown a PTSD. It, what, what would we be looking for if in someone who's got PTSD? Because I, I know that perhaps uh, not all survivors have it, but I, I've possibly seen it in the group more in, in um, the partners or people who witness the actual event. Yeah, that, that's my experience as well. I do know that some survivors can also mm -hmm. definitely experience PTSD, but in my experience I've seen it very often in uh, family members and it takes the form of kind of hyper, let's put it this way, um, hyper arousal. So you're really always on the watch out, really jumpy, really easy to be startled because your body is such a state of activation that it's difficult to relax. Obviously, it impacts on, uh, on sleep. And there is also um, kind of avoidance very often of, the, of, the, of something that has happened that is a feared stimulus. So it might be avoidance of a particular room where this happened, avoidance of a particular road. Um, and it can be, it can be disabling. Um, it can lead people to take kind of extreme life decisions such as moving home or, or things like that. Um, and it, it is addressable. Um, it is possible because basically kind of response has been associated with a trauma, but it's possible to desensitize in PTSD terms this response and make people um, kind of process the traumatic information and make it less traumatic. So it, it does work. The important thing again is identifying it. Because when, when Paul was asking me to do this and I was thinking, mm, what's, the, what's the value? How can people benefit from uh, listening to a talk like this? And, and I think it's about uh, being aware that obviously we, um, we don't realize kind of waking up in the morning, oh, I'm depressed now, I'm anxious, um, if we don't have the right tools to, um, to, to identify it. Some people may be more familiar with the symptoms and some people may be less familiar, but it's most likely something that's been coming up for some time. It doesn't happen out of the blue, even if there is a, a traumatic event, but uh, still people kind of think, okay, no, it's, it's tough, but I can carry on, can carry on, can carry on. And then at some point, like, no, I can't. So it's, it's about understanding also the signs and symptoms that um, anxiety is coming up. And, and you know, when, when things are beginning to impact on life to this point, they are avoiding um, situations, avoiding places, and anxiety is really high, sleep is poor, um, relationship with family and friends uh, are being affected. Uh, that's, these are all warning signs that it's good to talk to somebody about this because um, something may be done. Is, are, are symptoms of PTSD, are they, do they sort of materialise straight away or do, do you see them like weeks or months or even years later? For the family member yeah. potentially? I mean, you do see a lot of hyperarousal hyperactivation immediately. Uh, but for some people, it will go down and will kind of be. Uh, we're, we're not. I mean, it's something that will always be in people's mind potentially. It 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 does. Not say it, it's it's affecting people's life. It may or may not be affecting their lives, but it's there. But you you never know at the beginning which person is going which way because for some people they will be 
okay after one month and for somebody else it will continue to affect them and then perhaps affect them even more. Um, there may be some kind of background situations that may point to one direction or not. So if you already got a stressful life with complicated family history and this happens, I think in my mind you're quite at high risk. But again, it's individual circumstances. So we look at the whole picture, the event, but also what's surrounding the event. Is there a social network? Is there a previous history of anxiety or depression? Is there any coping mechanism that people have that will work in this situation? So we look at all these things. Mm -hmm. If, if as you talked about uh, avoidance of particular places, but could that also include, include avoidance of talking about it as well? And if, would you recommend people talk about it? And if they were reluctant, would it, would it be best to talk about it with a professional rather than just amongst the family? Well, some people would be more, some people would be less um, inclined to talk about it. It's, again, there's no one size fit all approach. I mean, for some people, it's, I guess it's okay not to talk about it because it's just an event that's happened. Um, but if not talking about it is not processing the, the whole event and, and there is this stress, I think the key is, is, uh, is this event and the associated response causing a lot of this stress. Um, at that point, then it, it might be actually something to consider. But you know, not talking about it in itself is... I wouldn't say it's necessarily a sign that things are wrong because some people may just not want to talk about for for a number you know for you know it might be for um, for a survival it's just something they shrug off and say oh yeah I had this and believe me I've met many people that just were like okay yeah what's the, what's the big fuss about yeah um, do, and, you, and do I, they ever come back and see you a bit further no, down the and, and and that's what no because you're talking about people that don't have access to services but in my, my, I've also had people that I've invited back and they just mm -hmm. didn't want to come because presumably and luckily their life was back on track I hope I certainly think that for most of them that was the case I know that for some it might be they just didn't want border professionals or it might be just too far away because we cover quite a large geographical area but there are certainly people that get on and get on with their life and don't think about it too much. I mean, just uh, you touched on the geographical area. So obviously, or not obviously, but people who come to the CTC have a good chance of seeing you if they're, they're caught in the, or filtered through you or the, the care clinic. But what about people who are outside of that uh, catchment area in the other parts of the country? I know there aren't, similar services all over the place it's a little bit of a lottery so what would your advice to people be if they wanted to see someone like you it depends what depends on what their specific experience was like so if um there, there has and then it depends whether we're talking about the survivor themselves or, or the family member and how much the brain injury if there has been has played a role into this I mean, as a rule of thumb, um, there is psychological therapy available um, all over the country via GP to start with that can then refer into what is known as IAT, although locally may have, does have different names, but basically it's the Improving Access to Psychological Therapy Scheme. So there are psychological practitioners, and I'm complicating things now because they're not psychologists, they're trained differently, but they are trained people very good at what they do. They provide CBT uh, and not just CBT, I should stress. There are a number of um, evidence-based psychological treatment. Um, so via the GP, people can access this. There, is, there are different in different angles of the, different parts of the country. So that's a service available to everyone. Waiting list may vary and people may not be, the, the therapists may not be aware of the specific issues of no cardiac arrest, etc. But you know, for some people that's that's not really a problem because you know the, the the issue that we, they present with is the same as issues that other people will present with. Um, so that's a start. If there has been a significant brain injury or a brain injury that is impacting, or if you no, know, and I certainly have had a um, couple of patients and like 
caseload, not, not recently, but definitely the past two years, where cognitive impairment was not so subtle, was kind of mild to moderate, I would say, um, as unfortunately uh, meant that people had to lose their job. They, they lost their jobs because they were no, no longer able to, to do it. Um, and obviously this caused um, emotional uh, consequences as well. Mm -hmm. I think it would be okay to be referred to a neuropsychologist, but how do we access one? And the tricky thing is also that most people with cardiac arrest who have mild to moderate brain injury, they actually don't have a diagnosis of brain injury, um, simply because if we do a CT scan immediately after the cardiac arrest, well, we either don't see anything or we see something dramatic that usually is not compatible with life. So, and then people, if they recover and they leave hospital, they don't normally get a CT scan later unless there is something. And unfortunately for to access psychology and neuropsych neuropsychology and the neuro team where this is available in the country, uh, you do need a neurological diagnosis. So it, it, it is tricky. Um, it is tricky. I think a case can be made, but there's no guarantee that people will be seen. Um, mm -hmm. It really depends. It's a bit of a postcode lottery. It is, it is. Oh, we, need, so I'm not, we need the care team all over the country, don't we? Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm not Are giving you willing very... to travel? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it, I think the lack of imaging and the lack of uh, identified brain injury, especially in somebody that does have problems, it's could, a limiting factor. Yeah. Could it also be a lack of understanding, perhaps at the GP level, about what can actually happen, well, and even perhaps in the, the cardiology ward, about what the impact is on a cardiac arrest survivor and the family? Because it's not not just a cardiac incident, is it? It's it's a it's, it's a bit more. I would say it's a bit more. I mean. Yes, when, when I started, as I said, I thought long and hard, and I think is this, it is needed. And um, yeah, I think it is needed. I think it is needed. Uh, otherwise, some people slip through the net in a spectacular way, hopefully not too many. And other people um, that could get support don't get it, and then things may be a bit worse later. Um, I mean, you have to think that the average GP surgery probably has one or two people that have survived an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So it's normal for the GP to not know much about it. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely fine. I mean, we, we would like to train people to recognize these symptoms a bit more. And perhaps we can think about it um, in, in terms of educating um, other teams to do what we are doing now. Perhaps that's the way forward, but it's, it's definitely not uh, um, happening yet. And in terms of cardiologists, yeah, they, they, they are treating a different problem. So, I mean, they, in my mind, they should be aware that this is happening to many survivors, but they, they are not. Some, some are interested, very interested, very on board, and some are probably not so on board. Um, it, we should have a really comprehensive team addressing um, all the issues that come up. But okay, so, so there's about contacting uh, or getting in contact with you is basically to go via your GP and Try and, try and persuade them that you need some help in some way, really. Um, if someone, we had some questions put forward um, previously. I mean, there's one lady who was uh, e extremely desperate in her, her needs. She was uh, had a lot of depression, anxiety, and she's incredibly fearful of, of shocks from a, a device or ICD. What, what could you say to her? What would be her path? It, would it to be go to the GP? Or, I mean, it, or is it, it, more? It, she's lucky enough to live in an area where there is a cardiac psychologist, which is basically a health psychologist that works with cardiologists. Um, that would be really the, the best way forward. Um, I mean, as, pa as part of my job in, in central London, I also spend some time in Charing Cross Hospital and um, and I know for sure because there are some of my colleagues that work there and they deal um, quite frequently with people that have had an ICD and may have had a shock or maybe more than one and they may all have been appropriate shocks or maybe inappropriate. And there are a number of psychological issues, of course, that can arise um, because the uncertainty of whether it's going to happen or not and it can affect life in many different ways. Um, if there is a service available locally, 
I wonder whether the GP knows about it or whether I, I think the first port of call is definitely GP. Um, and then, you know, it might take some time because it can enter into a triage process and, and, and people just need to understand your problems and the severity of the problems. But then you, you, if there is service, specific service available in the area, then that's where you'll end up. Um, I can't guarantee that there is a similar service in, in whatever area uh, this person lives. But, um, okay. Um, and also, uh, from my point of view, I, I would say to that person or anyone else, one of the, the best therapies I, I find, and I think many others will, will be to try and speak to other survivors, um, try and meet them face to face and uh, talk about it, and that, that can really help a, a lot. So we haven't really had so many meetups uh, this year. We're, we're a little bit lacking, although we've got the big one coming in um, in September, and, and uh, Dr. Mion will be talking there for us, uh, so you can come and meet him there if you'd like. But do go to your GP if, you, if you've got a, a problem, is the, the basic answer. Um, yeah, just one thing I'd like to, again, in the, just because we want to try and normalize. So if you have an ICD and you, and you are worrying about a number of things, I can tell you that it's pretty common to worry about you know, will I be able to swim, for instance? And will I be able to run again to do any physical activity? Will I be able to be intimate with someone? Um, what happens if I have a shock and somebody is touching me at that time? I mean, they might feel like crazy worries sometimes that they're not. Um, they're very common and you are likely to think about your life and the fact that it can end very suddenly because it's happened and you never thought about it until it actually did happen. So. Just in the context of normalizing all these thoughts, I'd like to say that you know, if you are watching this and you never talk to anyone about it and you don't know whether it's normal or not, yes, it is. And if it's causing you any, any distress, any problems, then it's, um, it's good to go and talk about it. You, you touched on um, CBT earlier. Could you tell me a little bit about that and also the other treatments that you can offer? Uh, I know some people have had EMDR as well. Yeah, it, it, that, that, yes, let's, um, let's stick to CBT for the time being. I mean, people will have heard about cognitive behavioral therapy and it, it is what it says on the team. So it's cognitive and behavioral. So we try and address both behaviors and cognition, which is the way you the way you reason, the way, the way your thinking skills work. Um, and obviously it stems from the assumption that it's all linked. So the way we behave is linked to the way we feel and is linked to the way we think. Um, and I think a typical example in um, problems that many people experience after cardiac arrest is the anxiety. And I think the PTSD arena is is where it's very significant, it's what I was uh, mentioning earlier. But in the, we can also talk about this in, in depression because there is also um, a very common scenario where people may be a bit skeptical, about, oh, they may be a bit afraid of doing um, a lot of acti physical activity. So it might start off as a kind of physical concern. Um, am, I going, am I doing too much? Am I not doing enough? Um, and this may lead people to kind of um, stay at home most of the time or a lot of the time and miss out on social opportunities, which in turn may lead to um, kind of restricted life um, enjoyment because you're not spending as much time with um, families and friends, which can lead to depression. So, it's, so we start off from a somatic kind of com complaint, which has good grounds because you might actually have to kind of cut down on the level of physical activity or you may feel very fatigued, which again is a, a very common um, post-cardiac arrest symptom. And for some people it might slowly progress into um, a depression and then we can try and address this in different ways by looking at the level of activity, by introducing, oh, I mean, it's, it's not prescriptive, obviously for every person there is a, um, a discussion, it's a kind of um, collaborative approach. That's what psychology is about. It's about understanding, you're, you're the expert but, uh, of your life. We know what works and then we try and figure out what 
um, will work in your particular case. And we try and change behaviors that are contributing to depression and we try and change cognitions um, which may be contributing. So some, some of the things that people think may be not factual, may be inaccurate, may be just contributing to the overall um, mental difficulty. Um, and to be fair, because Paul, you mentioned the EMR, EMDR, EMDR yes, um, which basically is, um, is another, uh, it's nice approved, which basically means that it, it is evidence-based. There, is, um, there are randomized controlled trials that show that works and there is some theoretical background. But basically, it's, it's about addressing the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and one might say with some significant commonalities with uh, the way CBT does it and with some added, um, some added intervention. It's, it's divided into a set number of sessions. Um, but you know, the, the goal is always to basically to process the trauma, which causes a lot of uh, distress. So in PTSD, we have basically unprocessed trauma that keeps being relieved, sometimes in very powerful ways, um, and may take over. Um, it, again, it's quite common to have similar experiences earlier on. I think it's good to stress, it's important to stress that um, you know, the first few days and weeks may not necessarily indicate how you're going to feel six months down the line. Um, and that's why PTSD is never diagnosed within the first month. So we talk about acute stress um, response, acute stress disorder. I think right. that's important. Um, PTSD is only uh, above a month. And sometimes some will say, uh, when, it, when it continues for, for considerably longer. Don't want to talk too much about PTSD, but you know, if you have a, a similar response, then you might find, make you, you might feel like when you are experiencing a flashback that you're not really there. It's, it's like not being alive. It's like being fuzzy and dizzy. And, and it's always good to find something that grounds you there in the moment. So it, if this is the way you're feeling when you're having a flashback of the situation and again, with a proviso that in the initial days and weeks, it might, it might be a bit like that. But if it's been going on for a lot longer, then I think that's definitely a reason to look for help and ask to the GP to be referred. Because it is treatable and treatment works very well. And the earlier, the better. Is there, are there any sort of um, techniques or tips that you can give to people to perhaps uh, help them process it themselves? Or is it a case of just talking about it or... Uh, I mentioned before we came on air about something that I, I, I think a lot of people find is when they write about their experience, um, you know, even if it's just putting a post in the group or when they um, go a little bit deeper into their experience and write about it for the blog, that so many people say that, that it was a cathartic process for me. And, uh, and I mentioned to you there's an actual therapy called expressive writing which is an article on the, the website about. And what, what are your thoughts about that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, no, obviously, I don't want to generalize. Um, some people would like it, some people wouldn't. Everything that helps process what's happened is potentially positive. So, yes, if, if you are into that sort of thing, um, definitely. But um, you know, every person is different. So there, there are some people that have... Um, a, kind of suggested it to and they were not particularly keen. But for other people, it might be great. I actually personally think it's great. Whenever somebody is keen to do that, um, very happy because normally there are a lot of things that come up that help to make sense of what's happened because it's about making sense and sometimes finding a new sense. Mm -hmm. But definitely, yeah. I imagine you talk about making sense, I guess CBT sort of helps you process those thoughts to actually make sense of of what's happened, is it? Yeah, moving forward from CBT. Now, CBT is very good. Um, when you have a lifelong condition, sometimes I like to use something called ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, which also integrates element of mindfulness, so being there in the moment. So, and this is more around making the most of life, regardless of what's happened. Um, so this is just to say that there are a number of 
approaches that can be taken and there is something that is suitable for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, CBT is definitely very powerful. Um, you, you touch on mindfulness there, and it, which is sort of a, a modern take on meditation for many yeah. people, isn't it? And you, you recommend that? And um, y yes, I mean, in, in general, definitely. Um, it's about yeah, grounding yourself in the moment. Um, and yes, um, you, you don't have to be in a critical state to adopt it, do you? I mean, no. it, it's something that's been around for a very long Absolutely. time and it's got a, a lot of evidence to back up that it actually helps relieve stress and other conditions. Yeah, it's not a panacea. Um, so it's not about giving out mindfulness to everyone so we don't have to pay for anything else <laughs> in terms of health service. But it, it is definitely helpful um, and it can be incorporated in, it can be part of therapy um, and sometimes you know if you're really distressed about an event and really hyper activated hyper anxious sometimes we start with you know, kind of progressive relaxation progressive muscle relaxation and mindfulness just to try and calm down and to be a bit more receptive because you know if you're really that activated it, it's difficult to do anything mm -hmm. so there are different bits and pieces of um, therapies that can be used and combined. Well, uh, one of the questions that we've got, um, it, it sort of touches on, um, she, it's, it's linked to the fact that they've had a brain injury and she says it, it thinks that they've cracked it, i.e. she's recovering from it. And then she had another um, incident, she had a, an actual heart attack and then was a bit all over the place again. Right. Uh, and I know a lot of uh, cardiac arrest survivors and their partners describe life as being a bit of a roller coaster mm -hmm. post. And it, it, is that is this all linked psychological and the emotions? Is it linked directly to sort of the brain injury? The, what What do you think? No, I mean, what do you mean? The is linked to the brain injury? Um, it, it is is well, I probably didn't phrase that very well. Sorry, but the. Uh, this person had a brain injury, which I would guess a lot of us do, and as that perhaps um, repaired itself, would, would that be fair? Or okay. she be, became adjusted to the, the impairments that she had got, she settled down, mm -hmm. and then she had another incident, and I guess that could be, it doesn't matter whether it's a, she's had another a, a heart attack, or mm -hmm. it could be a shock or something like that. Okay. Um, can that sort of disrupt your your feelings again and your emotions and the, the whole process? Yeah, I, I guess it's two different questions, but let's let's try. So it's um, first of all, well done for overcoming the um, the effects of the acquired brain injury. Um, for people that may be looking at this and um, having had a recent um, brain injury as a result of uh, cardiac arrest, uh, epoxy. I mean, th and many people recover. Um, some function. I mean, I'm, I'm talking now because you know we, we've got the, the a, a, it's a big spectrum. It goes from people that are I, I, okay. <laughs> you, you understand why I'm I'm dithering. But basically, we've got people that may be in um, you know, uh, disorder of consciousness and people that have very mild memory uh, problems. And so when I say that there is recovery, I don't I don't want to give false hopes that you know somebody in at the very end of the spectrum may actually make a miraculous recovery and return walking, talking and living a normal life. I don't think that's the kind of audience we have now anyway, but when we are talking about the kind of mild to moderate, um, what we have, what I have seen working for the care team is that there, there is recovery, uh, almost universal, and it does get better with time. There's no guarantee you'll be back at the beginning, but then again, you have had quite significant life experience anyway, so you'll never ever truly be the same, which may be actually in, in certain ways a good thing because I've had people telling me that life was different, but not necessarily worse because they have got to know a little bit more about themselves and they have restructured the priorities in life, etc. So that's, it's, it's, it's a significant event, but sometimes people react by kind of having a kind of positive growth so that's what may happen. Yes, there, there can be a recovery after an acquired brain injury, even after hypoxic ischemic. Historically, we thought it's, it's quite bad, um, but there can be. What if something then happens? I mean, that's, 
is becoming more and more the norm, isn't it? Because we are living longer, we have more and more comorbidities, and even if we manage to fight off something, chances are that something else will happen again. Um, and it can set you back, it certainly can. And then it's about looking at the kind of coping strategies and how did you manage to overcome the first difficulty and the, have the circumstances changed and can you use the same strength now to overcome this or do we need to develop a new set of skills or I mean, what's the situation now? Um, it will depend on individual circumstances here, but um, it's a similar process. It's another challenge and it may have to be faced in a different way, but um, it's, it's going to be a very common uh, occurrence as mm -hmm. we grow older and become a bit more. I think people went, uh, there used to be the, the line that once people had sustained a brain injury that that was it, you wouldn't be getting that bit of the brain back again, would you? Oh, but I it, wouldn't be working if that was the case. Well, that's right. <laughs> I think it, it's changed a lot in the yeah, last exactly. 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Um, there are all sorts of things that can happen. So you, there can be spontaneous recovery. Um, there can be a rewiring of the brain. Um, so by and large, when we lose brain cells because of an injury, well, they, they don't regrow really back. Um, but we do lose brain uh, cells every day anyway. Um, I once worked out how many we lose. I think we lose 10% of our brain mass over 100 years uh, just by living. 100 uh, years, do you mean? Yeah, I mean, if, oh. if you get to 100, oh, okay. yes, yes. If, people, if you get to 100 and you're very fit and healthy, etc., you will have lost 10% 10, 10 of the brain um, anyway, just because it, we, we have a limited amount of... Um, but it doesn't, of brain cells, it doesn't mean that you become less, uh, that, that cognition is significantly impact. Um, we just get better at doing the things that we normally do. So the, there is a lot of regrowing and, and it's been demonstrated in a number of studies uh, that if you, so even if you learn a skill like playing guitar, um, there was a really interesting study about taxi drivers in London and uh, how, how good their memory for um, visual, visual memory is. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, there is definitely a lot of um, spontaneous recovery and regrowth, etc. And then you, we can capitalize on this by working to help people regain or compensate for some of the functions that have been affected. Um, and again, the type of approach depends on how severe it is, but definitely it's, uh, it, there is improvement, yeah. yeah. Uh, are there medications or um, can diet affect that as well? well? Medication is not really my field, so I'm not prescribing doctor. So I, be, I think one of the issues that sometimes people after cardiac arrest experience is the seizures and seizures need to be controlled. And anticonvulsants are, they can have different type of effects on cognition as well, and on fatigue, and on alertness, etc. So, um, if seizures are a problem, then a neurologist needs to be involved because these can you know, prolonged untreated seizures, or they can further create brain damage. So you want them to be controlled. So yes, medication is important. Um, obviously, you need to lead a, as much as possible healthy um, life. I'm pretty sure there is an impact of diet, but um, I can't really say much more now because <laughs> I'm, I'm not um, familiar with the evidence of a particular type of diet on cognition compared to another type of diet. I'm sure there must be some evidence. We're not looking at big effect size, but this effect size is probably bad. Um, definitely, if you've had a brain injury and you drink a lot of alcohol, you might expect to be not doing as well. Mm -hmm. um, because as a rule of thumb, um, it's, it's a good point actually. It, but it, it, that's not to say you cannot have a pint or a couple say, of glasses if, of wine. If, uh, after, after something like a cardiac arrest and a, and a potential brain injury, which I would guess most of us are susceptible to, is something like alcohol, is it advisable? Um, it's not for me to say, but obviously drinking in excess is never advisable and even less so if you have had a brain injury. Yeah. Okay. And if you know you've had one, and it's, I mean, that's, that definitely can uh, affect people. 
And uh, you, you mentioned about seizures, and we did have another question with regards to dissociative seizures, which I'd never heard of before. Um, and they think that they are suffering from them, uh, but no one can give them a straight answer. Although I find not getting straight answers after SCA is a thing of the norm. Yes, I, I totally understand that. Um, and this person's sort of uh, in their early th- 40s and a, and a lady and they've experienced depression before. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those tricky things for the neurologist because somebody presents with a seizure, you would expect to see it on, a, on an EEG. Um, it's a kind of pattern of electricity in the brain, but uh, there's nothing there. But the person is experiencing the seizure. And it's very tricky for a neurologist because you might think maybe I'm missing them. And if no cause is found, then um, and it looks like this has been, it's been um, kind of investigated for quite some time, um, then sometimes the diagnosis of dissociative. I mean, that's this, this not specific to um, cardiac arrest. I mean, anything. Sometimes people develop them for no clear reason. Uh, it's actually quite frequent. I think, um, I don't remember off the top of my head the statistics, but I think there are quite a number of people that present to neurologists with um, this kind of pseudo-seizures, so seizures but without the expected um, electric activity in the brain. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I think um, it's a bit tricky for neurologists because they don't exactly know what to do because it's possibly not something that can be treated with medication. Again, this is not specific to um, cardiac arrest. Uh, it's actually the first time I've heard of it, but why not? I mean, it can happen. Um, I think where is available, I think um, neurologists will probably refer, um, will probably you know, investigate it as thoroughly as hopefully they will have done. Um, and then I certainly work with a, with a consultant neuropsychologist that I work together with a neurologist in um, addressing this, uh, so it was kind of joint clinic neurology and neuropsychology, uh, but that, that was a very specific kind of trial, so I don't think there's much available, but you know, I think psychology is okay to be involved, um, you know, if there has been a thorough, a thorough investigation, um, yeah, just to try and work out what's going on, because obviously the person is experiencing the seizure, it's just not the seizure as you would expect with the pattern of electrical activity. It's mm-hmm. just a different type, um, probably different causes. I know from um, doing a previous poll about the sort of symptoms that people get after they've had their cardiac arrest, and you've mentioned some of the common ones like the fatigue mm-hmm. and the uh, memory problems, and you haven't been, or we haven't talked about concentration issues and other uh, cognitive type issues, processing of information and what have you. But the, the, there are, I do remember being a, a, a big long list of lots of sort of strange type issues that maybe one or two people tend to get. And I guess it, they're very hard to nail down if they are directly related to the cardiac mm. arrest or, or have you got any thoughts on what else could perhaps be going on there? No. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Um, yeah, these are the most common. Um, I don't have the list to hand at the moment, but, the, yeah, but the, the, I know there are things which are probably are related to the brain injury, like um, uh, sensory type um, deviations from the norm, maybe becoming hypersensitive to sound and light. And, and there was one uh, question, which I know, I know it's perhaps not quite on topic tonight about... Um, synesthesia I think it was called about seeing colours and things like that um, there were a number of questions that uh, we had in that possibly were a little bit not off, off topic as it were so we haven't really covered them mm-hmm. right. yeah. I, yeah I guess that can be really strange and unusual thing that can happen um, but you wouldn't necessarily worry about this. You would think about the most common. And then if somebody comes up with something a bit bizarre, then we'll have a look together and think, is this anything to do? It, it might be. You know, if you've had a very long hospital admission months and there is evidence of brain injury and there is a difference between what you were before and what you are now, you know, chances are it might be, it might be related. 
And then, I mean, for me as a clinical psychologist, about what do we do about this now? Is this causing a problem? Is this remediable? Um, can we find ways around it? Is, I mean, what do we do with this? Because obviously people can come up with all different problems um, and situations and some will be something that we can address and some perhaps we don't need to address. But mm -hmm. Someone's asked, have you heard of open dialogue? I feel that a whole system approach is needed for families. No, I haven't heard. But I'll, um, I'll make a note. Someone's saying about moving house and you wouldn't be the first person that's had to move house. I know, of course. But, you, but it may not be necessary. It may not be necessary. And what would you advise first? Is it, it would be... Um, it it, if, it's, if it's early days, um, uh, just wait. Um, and I, I don't know um, whether it's somebody that I've seen or not. I mean, it, it all depends on what stages we are. But um, if it's early days, I think it's much better to wait. And, and um, you know, it, again, if it's somebody that's accessing our service, you know, just, just contact. Um, if not, contact the GP and, um, and take it from there. But, uh, it's I remember saying to someone once uh, who was... They were in a bit of a turmoil and they were thinking, well, there was a, a social situation. And I, I said, you know, it's a bit of a cliche that time is a healer, but don't make any big decisions within a year. And that, that was just from my personal experience and what yeah. I've seen within the group. Yeah. I mean, what, one of the things I remember is that one of my patients made a big decision um, and actually they had a brain injury that I didn't really detect. So some t I was aware of some memory problems, etc. But basically, to cut a long story short, um, the big decision to change house, um, except they didn't remember making the decision. So they found themselves <laughs> in, that, in that new house, not really understanding why they got themselves into that situation. Um, yeah, and that was a bit of a traumatic experience. I mean, moving house is not a, a, a light thing to go into, is it? It's no, it's not. It's not. It's um, stressful. <laughs> but I have to say, sometimes I've seen that you've come to, I mean, you've mentioned the kind of grief uh, curve where there's a bit of anger, the bargaining, and then um, I would say that's not necessarily the case for everyone because no, um, no, no. not, not everyone goes through that um, stages of adjustment but you know, stages of adjustment vary but there can be a, a bit of a dip down at the beginning um, and it's good to acknowledge that it's it can be a very stressful period and just hold your judgment for some time and don't don't make uh, really life-changing decisions early on what, what Marco is referring to is uh, last week um, I did a talk in a, a post-cardiac arrest conference and one of the slides I mentioned the um, something called the Kluber-Ross curve which is from a, a 1960s study about terminally ill patients and um, it's got this, I, I don't think I've ever posted it in the group actually but... Um, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you know I, on the one hand I think it gives an idea that you have to go through these stages to get back up and mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to and not everyone does and it also gives an idea of it it, it just happens to everyone um, now i think we've we've got more power to change things um, it's uh, it's and it's a 50 year old study and there are things i mean i'm happy to send another Perhaps you can write write a blog for me about. I could do. I could do. Yeah. I could do. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a different now, nowadays. It's diff, a bit different the approach. We don't think that things go in a, in a set order. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know if I said it, but yeah, I, on that talk. But I do know that there are lots of thoughts about people don't go through all the stages and they don't go in that linear path that that curve shows as well. So yeah. and there, there are lots of variations on that curve for all sorts of change aren't there mm -hmm. even in business now and things like that so yeah like you say things uh, it was 50 years ago and it's things evolved don't they it's, yes uh, our understanding evolves so. but I, I just found when I first saw it that it was uh, a lot of those stages resonated with me and what I've seen other people sort of going through the the anger and the the, the denial almost yeah. of, of it and 
Yeah, and sometimes there may be anger, yes. There may be anger from the survivor, sometimes also from family members towards the survivor, which they may also feel ashamed of. Um, but just, it's again a normal feeling, especially early on. Um, again, in, in the context of normalizing these responses. Um, so if you feel angry at a loved one that had a cardiac arrest in its early days uh, and feeling angry is scary, it's again another kind of normal feeling, but um, it, again, it all depends what happens later, if it just you know, settles down or it's, it continues in affects life. Mm -hmm. I think probably we're probably coming to the end of our little chat now. Of, uh, have you got any sort of last minute things that you'd want to say or any tips that you would, or uh, just words of wisdom that you could give to people mm. who perhaps at the start of the journey or, uh, or even if they're not at the start of the journey and that they're, they're still experiencing um, pain and suffering and is there any... I don't know, because obviously the audience that's um, watching us tonight, it's probably convinced that, oh, I'm hoping that if they weren't, we have managed to convince them a little bit about the importance of what we are doing. Um, I, would, I would like to seek their opinions about um, is what would you... What, so in an ideal world, whether you are going through it now, whether you went through it a few years ago, what sort of input would have been best? What sort of things do you wish had happened? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's my last comment is actually a question of a bit of feedback about what you what you think can be done better and should be done better. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that I took away from that uh, conference in in uh, Sweden was uh, that that was uh, an international conference where people came from all over the world. That there are. This is, we're still fairly early on in the process of actually supporting people post cardiac arrest, and one of the the, the guys there, the doctors, said, you know, he's been in doing this for 25 years, and sort of 20 up 10, 15 years ago, they were just celebrating the fact that people survived, um, but now people are starting to survive in numbers. They need to think a little bit further on and, and come up with some. Um, a real package of care for people like you guys are doing at the care team in Basildon. Yeah, there are now well, definitely well over, I mean, thousands of survivors a year. So, and there are so many people involved in the care that it's, it gets confusing for you. Some of the people you will never remember because um, you were either unconscious or it was too early on. But in the conference, it was quite clear that um, you know, there were cardiologists, intensivists, anesthesiologists, um, people that look at your EEG and see whether things are okay. Um, people that think about the outcome in kind of a five level scale where the last point is dead and the first is I'm okay. Uh, and it's a little bit too, kind of, you know, five levels to describe quality of life is a little bit limited. But then there's also people that uh, look at things from a much broader perspective and it, uh, getting these people to communicate with each other may not be easy. Um, and provide kind of continuity of care may be a bit challenging, mm. but some some of us are willing to do it, um, and we hope to convince other people that uh, it's actually worth doing it. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that, that was one of the things that uh, was said that the people there were uh, very much in a bubble. Where they understand that the challenges that um, survivors and their families are going through, but it's letting the wider world know. And there was a very much. Uh, a feeling that they everyone internationally has got to work together to to get the message out there. I mean, there are good people, and I felt um, the um, the second day of talks uh, were very much on track and talking about things that I think uh, are important to to us. So that there is hope for the future. I know it's a little bit late for some people, but uh, people, if you're a little bit further down the line than the others, uh, I think if you can feed back to the people earlier on in their journey that that can always be helpful and I think we as a peer support group can be one of the best um, therapies if you like to each other um, until the until the professionals have sort of sorted it out across the country and across the world. Yeah I think in terms of patient 
groups. I think if you have a good group with many members, and if you want to influence the way uh, the NHS provides therapy, obviously the NHS wants hard evidence, and that's sometimes very difficult to collect for a number of reasons. And you know, you're not talking of a uh, hundred thousand people that have. A Across the country, there are 100,000 people that have a stroke every year, cardiac arrest survivors, it's not as many, a few thousands, and not as much money going in it, not as much research being produced. The, you know, the way to influence it is, yes, to do research, good quality, but also having good representations, having um, kind of big patient group. The NHS is interested in hearing um, what, what, what patients want, and there are uh, focus groups with patients and so you know being part of this actually definitely helps um, but it's it is tricky <laughs> I agree that it's tricky but we are moving in that direction mm. it, it, the numbers in this group could help massively I think to influence some things and uh, because when you when I see these um, studies presented the, the numbers in the studies are very low usually and that's purely because there's not that many of us around, really, or not that many that get seen at a particular centre where a study can be undertaken. Um, I think on that note, we probably should wrap up. So thank you for everyone who's uh, been watching tonight. And uh, thank you very much for Dr. Mark Meehan for spending the evening with me. You're welcome. And with us. And thanks for all those uh, questions that everyone's uh, been given in. And just one thing that Charlotte uh, has just reminded me, if you need, feel like you need any counselling or anything like that, remember, as a member of our group, you can get free counselling thanks to SADS UK. Thanks, Anne and John, for that. And that's always worth accessing if you can't get any through your uh, NHS provider. Yeah, I will definitely take advantage of that if there is a need. Yeah, mm -hmm. didn't know that. You didn't know that? No. Okay. All right. Okay, then, thanks very much to everyone, and thanks, Marco. We'll You're see welcome. you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.